Okay, uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and thank you once again for your patience. Uh, we, we're, running a, we're running a little later, but uh, really appreciate uh, that you can be here. Oh, I thought it was switched on. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so, my name is Saurabh and I serve as the Vice Chancellor for Research and Internationalization at the University of Johannesburg and once again my appreciation to you for joining us this afternoon and I want to also recognize the National Research Foundation uh, for considering the University of Johannesburg to host the Nobel, the Nobel Inspired 2019 Lecture in Literature. And uh, I will acknowledge a few uh, of our guests just so that you know who they, who they are uh, and also for the contribution that comes about to the Swedish Embassy. Uh, Her Excellency uh, Mrs. Cecilia, Mrs. Cecilia Julian, the Ambassador of Sweden, and uh, there is the Ambassador, and thank you very much, uh, welcome Ambassador, Dr. Beverly Dahlense, Group Executive Science Engagement and Corporate Relations at the National Research Foundation, Mr. Olof Sommel, who is the Curator at the, at the Nobel Museum in Sweden, and Olof is actually here, I think, primarily for these, inspired, these inspiring lectures. And so thank you for joining us. Our speakers and panel members, uh, Dr. Sindhiwe Magona, and here is Dr. Magona, you will hear us now, and many of you will know her from the stellar works that she's done uh, in her life. And she will also be introduced formally by our program director, uh, Kirapo. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Sylvia uh, fullenhoff Homan, she's from the University of Johannesburg, and you'll also hear from her later. And Professor Fulda Dineo Pola, uh, Dean of Research at the University of Fulke. And if I haven't said her name correctly, she will correct me, I know that. Uh, and so we, we look forward to that. Representatives of other universities and our own university, from the different faculties who have joined us members of academia, members of the media, and distinguished guests, and also our students. And sometimes our students say, say why did you, you say distinguished guests, but you haven't recognized us. And that's because students are really distinguished for us. You are who we stand for as a university. So thank you very much to the student group that is here. Professor Ilva Rodney-Gumedi is also here. She's the head of the national office. She has a very Swedish look. Why do you have that? And Fazilva Rodrigumedi has recently joined us. Uh, uh, Mrs. Karabako Foleng <coughs> is the program director, and she'll be taking us through the event in more detail. I just wanted to welcome you. But I thought I'll say a couple of words. Uh, you do know the University of Johannesburg, I think, is a member of the association with us. I think uh, to say a few words very briefly about our association with this event and why we had this appreciation when it came to, when the request came to Dr. Bongani Noluga, who is seated, seated at the back. He heads the Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Study and he's also a board member of the of the NRF. And Dr. Bongani received the invitation for the Nobel Laureate and he shared it with me and I was very pleased to see that because the key thing that happens is that the Nobel Awards are actually awarded during this period and as you know that the award for literature was made for 2018 and 2019 just yesterday. And I, I think that the literature awards and the criteria for the literature awards are probably one of the more, more complex ones because it involves of course the literature and the work in the discipline but often the individuals who are recognized are also active in other ways. You know, they may have to be politically active, they may be active from a cultural perspective. So that combination, at least in my view, I think the literature awards are much more difficult. And I also learned uh, during the process that that if you are, you know, if you are an author in Indonesia and if you have to be recognized, and maybe you can speak to this, is that it, the text has to be translated uh, in different, in, as part of the concentration process. Uh, which I thought would be so much complex because sometimes the way that uh, language and communication occurs is so intertwined in the culture, in different contexts of culture. Um, so, so we are again very pleased that we had the we had the honor to host the literature um, and the humanities and social sciences faculty, faculty at UJ that has also been uh, really a support. And I know sometimes that you ask me very complex 
various questions. Uh, at times about awards and who are the recipients of the awards. But for those difficult questions, there are more learned colleagues here that will respond to you. My job was simply to welcome you. And from here, I will hand over to Carabo Olen, who will then take us through the rest of the event. So thank you and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sina, and um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carabo Olen, and I am really honored and delighted to be uh, steering this ship. And yes, I mean, I could speak a lot about awards as well. Uh, I'm a recipient of the South African Literary Award for Journalism. Uh, because my calling in life is to give literary works a public life. And I also understand the politics that come with uh, of, you know, you know, giving awards because I was also one of the judges of the Sunday Times Fiction Prize. We've got several award recipients uh, on this panel. And, um, but for me, what it comes down to is the fact that we need to carry on recognizing our writers, right? Because they're the merged society and they're the ones who are actually curating our histories. So every single opportunity that we have to recognize our writers and the complexity that comes with being human, um, I think it's important that we have these conversations and keep having those debates. Um, as Professor Gola said earlier on when we were prepping for this, that you know, um, consensus is a bit boring, you know? We need, we need to have those, we need to have those, uh, those debates. So, um, so what's going to happen is just some housekeeping rules. Please, if you are using your phone, please have it on silent. If you're going to take a call, do you mind leaving the room? <laughs> uh, because this is, a, this is a recorded session. Uh, the bathrooms are out the entrance uh, towards, your, towards your right. And um, otherwise, please um, relax, enjoy yourselves, and um, this is going to be a really, really amazing um, experience. So I'd like to welcome uh, to the floor now um, Her Excellency Ms. Cecilia Julian, who is the Ambassador um, of uh, Embassy of Sweden in Pretoria. She's based in Pretoria. And uh, she's going to give her opening remarks, followed by Dr. Bebni Damon. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, everybody, because I'm, I'm learning how to use pronouns properly, uh, because you know, we're living in changing times. So if I do say anything that's offensive in terms of using people's pronouns incorrectly, please disclaimer, I'm asking for apologies in advance. I'm learning, and uh, this is a learning space as well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Program director. And first and foremost, thank you to the University of Johannesburg for hosting us and, and having us here. Uh, we're very happy uh, to be here. And thanks again to the National Research Foundation for partnering uh, with us. As you know, this is the week of the announcements of the Nobel Crisis. We started uh, on Monday with the, with the Prize in Medicine, and then we went to Physics on Tuesday, Chemistry. Uh, on Wednesday, yesterday was the Prize in Literature, and well, today we got, I think, most reaches most, most attention in the world, which is the Nobel Peace Prize, which went to Africa again. I mean, half of it went to Africa last year with Dr. McQuaggy, and, and now it's the Ethiopian Prime Minister who got it uh, this year. So I think congratulations to, to Africa. Uh, <laughs> this sort of series of Nobel-inspired lectures in 2014 um, in collaboration with the National Research Foundation. Um, and the idea behind it is really to, to sort of observe the week of announcements, um, doing lectures at different universities to really inspire uh, students for the sciences, for literature, for excellence, and, and sort of create and look at some role models which we'd like to think of the laureates as role models for, for science, technology, innovation, uh, literature, and peace, uh, of course. So it's, it's been running this, uh, this week. We've been at the Nelson Mandela University on Wednesday, speaking on, on chemistry. Uh, we did some things in Victoria yesterday. Uh, but I'm very happy that you are here today. We're going to speak about literature, and we have an all-female panel. Um, I represent, uh, and I know we have the rock star of feminism in South Africa, Kumba. <laughs> we shared the stage before, and well, I don't think the audience remember that I was on the stage because we have the rock star of well, Ruby in. But I, I represent uh, the first feminist government in the world. I have to say, uh, 
and uh, Olaf from the Nobel Museum will have to sort of expand on that later. But I mean, you can't accuse the Nobel Prizes for being very feminist. Uh, I think when we look at the total, there's only 50 female laureates so far. And if we look at what I sort of call the hard sciences, there are 19 female laureates. This year, there's only one. A laureate in literature that got the prize for 2018 was a woman. But that's it so far. We still have the prize in economy in memory of Alfred Novella Monday. We'll see. We'll make some headway there. But, and I think this is worrying. Uh, as a feminist, uh, but as a woman, maybe you are be. We need more women present in the sciences, in, in innovation, because it's really. I mean, we can't need to just one half the men of the population to sort of drive developments in the world. So, one hope for me, and I think for Sweden, is that with these lectures we will also inspire uh, female students and female excellence. But I think we have the perfect setup for that today. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. Yes, it, it is lovely to have an all female panel because um, usually. What happens is that throughout the year we have manals, that's what I call them, all male panels. And then during August when it's Women's Month, then you know we become hyper visible, but then they don't pay us. <laughs> so it was it was just really nice to sort of look at this and not say, oh, it's an all-female panel. For me, it just, it just felt natural and it felt normal. And we need to sort of normalize the presence of women so that we're not always you know, trying to exceptionalize the fact that we are here, we've been here, we've been doing the most, you know? And um, that we need to center ourselves in these, in these conversations. So I'm really looking forward um, to, to, to the, you know, discussing the meaning and purpose of literature and post-apartheid South Africa. Dr. Beverly Damonse is Group Executive of Science Engagement and Corporate Relations at the National Research Foundation. NRF is doing amazing things in terms of promoting scholarship and research excellence in South Africa and, uh, and positioning um, our academy um, you know, in terms of global competitiveness. And um, what I like with what UJ does, I'm a VITSI, I'm based at the African Center for Migration and Society, so, but my bosses, you know, they gave me the all clear. But I want to say that you know, all our universities and the work that we're doing and what the NRF does in terms of funding sort of research excellence and making sure that you know, we showcase our work, not just on the continent, but we become globally relevant while responding to the needs of the community around us is, is, is really special. So I've got lots of time for the NRF. Dr. Damonse, please come to the stage. Thank you, Karaba. I would clearly give my five minutes to you any day <laughs> to have that third party uh, of motivation and approval for the NRF. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, Professor um, Surab Sina has welcomed everybody and really picked out the special guests. And uh, I'm not going to do that again in the, in the face of time. But just to say thank you very, very much uh, to the embassy, to the ambassador for the partnership, and to all our very special uh, guests. Uh, we've worked hard behind the scenes to ensure that we have the caliber of panel that we have. But I must say, uh, from the outset, this uh, partnership has been about, in this week, not so much about the Nobel Prize or the winners of the Nobel Prize, but for us it's been about um, showcasing research excellence, about um, really forming a dialogue about the issues of science, technology, innovation, and how this affects our daily lives and the conversations we need to have about it. So from my perspective and the portfolio, it's about the relationship between science and society and to make sure that we continually engage, uh, whether it's controversial or not. Uh, we usually find that in times of contro controversy is when we really need to be engaging uh, and, and as well in times of peace. So I think when you spoke about mirrors to society, that, that is one of the, you know, the terms I think would really um, talk about what we were intended through these lectures. So that through the expertise, through the, the people who engage us, we mirror to each other, uh, in this case, the issues of uh, literature. And it's so intimately connected to so many issues in our lives. So I'm, 
I'm really um, I'm happy for this. Also, from an NRF perspective, we have always been, you know, last year it was the physics prize, so the lectures were in physics and astronomy, and then in peace at WITS, uh, uh, yes, uh, last uh, 2018. Uh, and before that, you would always get the uh, comment that you are really focusing on the natural sciences. Where is the conversation around the complexities of being human, uh, the complexities of what we face as human beings and the kind of things we need to be talking about? And that actually that is what this lecture is about. I think it's, it's really about literature, but the conversation can take us in so many different directions. And I'm hoping that is what happens today. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to the University of Johannesburg, but also to JS, the uh, Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Studies, who've worked with us closely to getting this event uh, where it is, and obviously the uh, Embassy of Sweden. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Hoping we have a great conversation this afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Damonte. And it is important, you know, narrative is, is important. Even, even science tells a story, right? And um, I'm very keen on sort of doing interdisciplinary work where we all speak to each other, where the academy is no longer constructed of these silos. Uh, when you talk about decoloniality and transformation is when we start to all speak to each other and realize that we're sharing one common thread, which is our humanity. So when we're discovering things, when we're creating new knowledge, we need to have these conversations with each other. So I'm always making a case for using um, literature and, and storytelling as a tool, you know, so even teaching scientists how to communicate their research to make it more, you know, accessible to the public so that we start to create the knowledge that we need to advance society. So um, I'm, I'm very, very interested in, in, in the direction that these conversations are going to take. And then just another shout out to Jayas. Uh, who knows Shoma Josi? She's an alumnus. You know she's an alumnus? of jazz, so um, you know, UJ is creating some amazing things. So um, I hope one day I might become a fellow myself. <laughs> now it's time to look at the background and context of the Nobel Prize Awards uh, with Mr. Olaf uh, Sommel, Sommel, who is the curator of the Nobel Museum in Sweden. Round of applause, please. Thank you all. Um, it is great to be here. Uh, first of all, uh, yet another thank you to the National Research Foundation and the Embassy of Sweden for inviting me here, and as well, of course, to University of Johannesburg for hosting this event. Um, our topic today is literature, and I feel it resonated, this idea that literature is the discussion that we have about ourselves, our humanity, and what we feel. The hard sciences, as Ambassador Julien mentioned are important, but we need also to know ourselves. And the Nobel Prize in Literature is arguably the most well-known lit literary award in the world. Um, it has been awarded to some of the greats, uh, Morrison, Gordimer, Hemingway. It has missed some of the greats, Tolstoy, Virginia Woolf, Franz Kafka, and many others, uh, many, many others. Uh, the, um, the Nobel Prize in Literature is the only prize in the humanities or the arts that was instituted by its founder, Alfred Nobel. Why he did so, however, is almost perfectly clear. Nobel is born in Sweden. Uh, this is why I'm here, in a sense, it's a Swedish award. Uh, in 1833, into a family that was really of science, a family of engineering, of invention, of manufacture. After a poor childhood in Sweden, he moves to St. Petersburg with his father in the early 1840s, and there, the young Alfred Nobel is exposed to something newer. Now he is exposed to literature. His father was an inventor. His brothers were clearly along the line of inventors and manufacturers. But the young Alfred, as it turns out, had a streak for the romantic, at heart a poet. If we look into his library from these days, we can see what he read. He read Byron 
uh, he read Shelley, uh, eventually he read Turgenev, uh, the Russian greats, and, ah, slides, we'll skip the slides, they're boring. Um, and this is what influenced him. However, his life became also one of invention. Poetry, as it turned out, did not pay the bills. Um, and he is sent out into a career of manufacture, invention, and, and research. It would be a miss to call Nobel a scientist. He really wasn't. But an inventor, yes, that, that definitely he was. He studies in Paris. He studies in Germany. He studies in the United States and returns to St. Petersburg his dreams of being a professional author firmly squashed. Um, now he needs to work with chemistry. Uh, his first major invention is made in first Sweden and then Germany, which is the dynamite, the first safe explosive, leading to a business empire that spans the world. Factories in West Coast, United States, East Coast, Australia, Japan, Europe, South Africa, fairly close to here in, in Mother Fountain, making the Nobel dynamite. But the success wasn't immediate. We can glean constantly from his letters that when he was struggling, he considered, maybe I should just stop. Maybe I should be a professional author. He sends out short poems to his friends and acquaintances. He always apologizes for them. He says, well, this is a little thing that I've been working on. Do you have any thoughts? I know it's very bad. Uh, please don't consider it. Uh, he said he complained about his English, which he wrote of in often. He said, well, I'm not very good in English. I do this mainly to practice. But he does write in Swedish and English and German and French and Russian, uh, all languages with he, which he spoke somewhat fluently. During all of his life, we can see the struggle in Alfred Nobel between these two parts of him. The inventor, the manufacturer of dynamite, of explosives, and later on, clearly military uses. This was the man who needed to make a living, to pay for his aging family, and who had a sort of a moral flexibility in terms of what he would use his inventions for. Initially, he felt that, well, mines is a defensive weapon, so I can make mines. But then it became more and more, how can I market to the military to make money? And on the other side is the teenager who read Byron and Shelley, who dreamt of this ideal world, uh, a world that he could find only in literature, he felt. When living in Paris during the 1870s and 80s, we can see from his library again what he read. The movements now in the arts were the Impressionists that were beginning to aspire. Nobel didn't care for Impressionism. He, he rented paintings from an art dealer and would change them when he got tired of them, mainly classical landscapes. For literature, he, he read Sola, and he didn't particularly like it. He felt Sola was too embedded in the smut and filth and reality of the world. Rather, he preferred the, the loftier authors, the ideal ones. His poetry isn't very good, that has to be said. Um, so we are thankful in the end that he doesn't become a career poet because he made a better inventor. Um, towards the end of his life, he publishes one play Called, it's called this Nemesis, a tragedy in four acts. Uh, his family and the executors of its will destroy this play after his death. They, feel, they felt it tarnished his legacy. It was arguing for internationalism. It was a bit sort of smutty here and there. Um, and they destroyed it. Only three copies remain, so we can now read it again, but for a long time it was lost. Um, this is the industrialist and inventor and wannabe poet that creates the Nobel Prizes. Towards the end of his life, he realizes he needs to create a lasting legacy. He is wealthy beyond any reasonable means. 
So he decides to give it away. Awards, he writes, to those who have conferred the greatest benefit on mankind. Within the fields of physics, chemistry, physiology or medicine, these are categories that lie close to him. And they are categories that initially seem very simple to comprehend in the context of greatest benefit to mankind or human, humankind. We can see that, well, the chemistry will make inventions, the physics likewise, the medicine will cure diseases. But then also he writes to those who in the field of literature has create, created the greatest work in an idealistic direction. He felt that literature was something that could be for the benefit of humankind. He ends off with a peace prize to those who have worked for disarmament, peace conferences, and fraternity amongst nations. He passes away December 10th, 1896, uh, surrounded not by his family, but only by his paid servants. And now comes a difficult part with the Nobel Prizes, because now comes the interpretation of his will. His will is released in early 1897. There's a realization that there are prizes to be awarded, and there's a realization that these prizes are to be vast in terms of monetary value. Many scales of magnitude larger than anything else. The literature prize he wrote was to be awarded by quote, the Academy in Stockholm, end quote. Um, it was initially a bit unclear what he meant, but the witnesses to the will were clear that he meant the so-called Swedish Academy. The Swedish Academy is a literary institution based in many ways on the L'Académie Française in France, 18 members to make sure that the quality of the Swedish language and literature remains high and pure. Uh, they had been established quite a while earlier, and around the time of the Nobel Prize in Literature, they were not in high regard in the general public in Stockholm. They were felt to be old. Old, not very modern, not in tune with what was modern literature. And they were given the unenviable task of deciding what Nobel meant with literature in an ideal direction, idealistic direction. The first question was literature, what does that mean? And it was decided that literature was not to mean only novels and belles lettres. It was to mean anything that the Swedish Academy deigned to have literary merit. Over the years, we've seen not only novels or lyricist or short stories, we've seen speech writing, we've seen historical biographies, we've seen philosophy, we've seen drama awarded. We've seen text writers awarded recently with Bob Dylan, which created a stir. Literary journalism with Svetlana Alexievich. Uh, these are the aspects of literature that the Swedish Academy have deigned to award. An idealistic direction also caused trouble. What did he mean? Well, we know what he read. He read the Romanticists. He read these lofty ideals. And initially, these were the things that they awarded. Hence, no prize for Tolstoy, which was seen as a scandal in the day. The Academy felt that Tolstoy was too grounded in reality, not having these lofty ideals as Nobel would have wanted. Over time, thankfully, this lessened. We can see in the prize for Beckett, when they first discussed Beckett, it was felt that no, this is this is too bizarre, this is too difficult, this is too depressing. This is not in an idealistic direction. A few years later, they changed their mind and decide that Beckett's absurdism really shows what humanity can achieve. The Nobel Prizes in Literature were announced yesterday uh, with the 2018 prize awarded to Olga Tokarczuk uh, for a narrative imagination that with encyclopedic passion represents the, uh, the crossing of boundaries as a form of life. Uh, and with the 19 prize to uh, Peter Hanke uh, for an influential work that with linguistic ingenuity has explored the periphery and the specificity of human experience. 
looking at these two prizes, the Academy has commented public on what unites them and what separates them. Both of them, the Academy has said, are border writers, growing up on the border in Poland and Austria, respectively, and that informs their writing. Uh, with Hanke taking a micro approach and Tokarczuk taking a more of a map approach. It has to be noted also, of course, that they have different generations. Tokarczuk is born in 62, and she is one of the greatest European writers in the post-1989 generation. Certainly very well loved in Poland. But she is also an activist, not particularly popular with the Polish regime as she has constantly criticized their work with their own history. Uh, Hanke is the older generation. He's seen as one of the great authors of European literature post-World War II. And he has also received criticism for his statements, in this case on the Balkan Wars, where he, where he made pro-statements for the Serbian side and spoke at Milosevic's funeral. Uh, Anders Olsson, the chairman of the Nobel Committee for Literature, has addressed these questions specifically regarding Handke, where he says that we are a price for literature. Uh, and this is a statement that is not obvious, uh, but it's their statement. And looking at the history of the Nobel Prize in Literature, that we see that this is what they award. They try always to look at literature, be it in novels, short stories, historical fiction or text writing. Um, this is what they want to award. They want to award work that can inspire us by their literary merits, show what can be achieved for the greatest benefit of humanity. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sommel. Um, I really like this idea for, you know, literature towards an idealistic direction. And I think that um, that is what writers, you know, aspire towards and, and, and artists and people who are involved in inquiry in its, in its various forms. And uh, now we're going to um, look towards the direction of Dr. Cindy Wemagona, who is uh, delivering uh, this afternoon's keynote address. She's an award-winning author, storyteller, motivational speaker, actor, Tosa teacher and translator. She has written children's books, stage plays, books of short stories, including Living, Loving and Lying Awake at Night, which was one of Africa's 100 best books of the 20th century. Autobiographies, Archbishop Ndungani's biography from Robben Island to Bishop's Court. Novels, radio plays and a screenplay. Her novel Beauty's Gift was shortlisted for the 2009 Commonwealth Writers' Prize for Africa. And that's when um, I first fell in love with Umama Sindiwe's uh, writing. It's, 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 such, it's such a hot story, you know, because it also speaks truth to uh, what women go through and the sacrifices um, that, that come with being a wife. And it was during the height of, you know, when, when HIV infections were at their highest in South Africa. So it, it was a really hard hitting piece of work um, that made us really sort of question ourselves and look at our agency as women. So it is, it is a seminal piece of work. She graduated with a BA degree from UNISA, an MSc in organizational social work from Columbia University, and was a New York Foundation for the Arts Fellow in the nonfiction category. Her accolades include the Gunzani Award, the Maltino Gold Medal, and the Order of Ikamaanga. She was also a joint winner with, the, with Nadine Gordimer of the Imbok Otto Award, and she holds honorary doctorates from Rhodes University, or the university currently known as Rhodes, <laughs> we still call it that, and from Hartwick College. Do you also have an honorary doctorate from Forte? No, next year. Next year. <laughs> Ooh! <laughs> Prof, the convocation, has the convocation decided? Ooh, we're breaking, we're breaking news, it's breaking news. But <laughs> an extra round of applause for Dr. Cindy Wemagona. Um, can we please adjust the microphone? Yeah, some of us forgot to do something. Dynamite, small packages, etc., <laughs> etc. Et
thank you. Oh, it, is, it is at this point that I, I know I am not a wise person. I may be very old, but not wise. Uh, thank you, Program Director, for the inspired uh, introduction. Your Excellency, Ms. Cecilia Hulin, uh, Ambassador of Sweden to this country. Thank you for being here. Uh, Professor Sinna, Deputy Vice Chancellor of this University of Johannesburg. Dr. Beverly Damons, Group Executive uh, Science Engagement and Corporate Relations National Research Foundation. And uh, Mr. Olaf Sommel, Curator of the Nobel Museum in, in Sweden. Professor Sylvia Vovlenhoven, this university. Professor Pumla Gola, Dean of Research at the University of Forte. And uh, Dr. Bongani Mulunga, Director at Johannesburg Institute for, of Advanced uh, Studies. And representatives of universities, members of academia and other bodies, and whoever else I forgot to mention, is not uh, deliberate. Uh, thank you to one and all for being here. And I feel greatly honored to have been asked to deliver this lecture. The theme or the title of the lecture, as you all know, is the meaning and purpose of literature in post-apartheid South Africa. Now you all know what literature is, so we have literature, we have meaning, we have purpose, and we have post-apartheid South Africa. For me, this seems like a lethal combination. As any student will tell you, the meaning and purpose of a single book is a vast area of study in itself and of itself. And here we are asked to look and inquire into not just a book, but a body of work, something that can be described as literature. And then to further complicate our cause, not just in South Africa, but at a sp specific time in the history of that country, post-apartheid South Africa. Now, there is a challenge. What does post-apartheid South Africa mean? There are those, and some of the voices are quite stringent, that tell us that apartheid is still very much with us. But 1994 was a marker, and nobody will deny that we came as a nation to an understanding that yes, a lot of what racial and racism, racial oppression meant may remain, but it is no longer the law of the land, and that makes a big difference. Literature, I went to the dictionary, among other things, include imagination or creative writing. And the meaning of literature, thank you, meaning is defined, again, by the dictionary, as described as to have a purpose or intention to have a consequence. Purpose and meaning, to my way of looking at things, seem to me very aligned. Purpose is a desired or intended result or effect. I dare say, very uh, robust scholarship has gone into the investigation to, to discern if there is a difference, and they will, I didn't do that. To my way of thinking, they are aligned. The purpose 
and, and the meaning are aligned. So taking into account then, we are therefore looking at South African creative writing after the widely reported and much celebrated de demise of apartheid. That's our task this afternoon. 25 years ago, as the world held its breath watching a veritable miracle unfold in apartheid South Africa, one of the questions that cropped up was, what will South African writers write about now that apartheid is gone? And perhaps there was some validity, some justification for those kind of alarm bells. I leave that to you. For my part, what the question did was remind me what the whole point of writing is as a writer. Why do we write? What is the point? Very few writers achieve wealth because they write. So why do writers write? The world agrees that work, we work and work very hard, and writing is a very hard job. As successful writers, if I'm lying, is work. If we are not working to get wealthy, so why bother doing it? The speaker preceding me here, talking about the Nobel Prize for Literature, touched on it. And at the United Nations General Assembly in 1945, Eleanor Roosevelt touched on it. All work, but particularly creative work, where you use your imagination, should be, ought to be geared towards the betterment of humanity. That's the idea, that's the ideal, that writers write to stamp on our foreheads, on our, in our souls, what life and the living thereof entails. What it should be, what it could be, so that people grow up that storytelling we are the stories we tell. Grow up with stories that affirm them, stories that push them, that trigger in their imagination what they could or should aspire to. That is the whole point. Post-apartheid South Africa, are we looking at something like that? Most, if not all, imaginative or creative writing is purposive. It's there, the writer thinks, to amuse, to warn, to instruct, or some other idea like that. But the writer tells a story, and stories matter. Stories matter. It is because of the, nobody comes to the world already formed in opinion, no. It is the stories of our growing up, the stories around, you know, family gatherings, the stories at dinner table, well, if you have tables, the, sto <laughs> the stories in your family and the stories in your community, the stories on TV, in literature, the stories you read, the stories we tell one another, those are the things that make us be who we are. Therefore, to me, today's talk is particularly important for South Africa, especially now. A sad thing is that nobody thought it was important enough to get somebody better to do it, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll do my best. Writers write with intent. You don't just sit and say, I'll write a book, and you don't think what you hope to achieve through the writing. I'll give you an example. When I wrote my first novel, after doing other writing, autobiography, poetry, short stories, you know, essays, I wrote Mother to Mother. 
And it pains me when I read in books of literary criticism that a, 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 a critic would see the mother, mother to mother is about, is the words of the mother of a killer to the mother of, of, of the victim. That he, you know, all this critic saw was that this mother, the mother of the, of, of the killer, was he like fixated at one point. She had no movement. She had no vision of a better tomorrow. I will give you that. It, and that points to something we haven't managed in this country. We write books and critics who do not understand the system out of which we write. You know, for me, Mandisa, this woman, goes to the mother of the child who is no longer alive because that is in our traditional knowledge systems. You cannot go on fighting. At some point, you have to make peace. And it is usually accepted that it is the person who has, or the family of the wronging party who must take the initiative. Because if you, the wronged, come to me, it's a fight. If I come to you when my family has wronged you, I offer, I offer the door towards healing. She didn't say that. <clears throat> when I was asked by the University of uh, Vaya Vaya, they didn't come to me directly, uh, Stellenbosch, to do a children's book called Skin We Are In. The university had looked at the researcher who had been doing a lot of work at Stellenbosch, she's an American scientist professor, on skin color, on the evolution of race, on that kind of thing. And Stellenbosch said, we need a book for the children of this country, that's intent, to read children, to make them free of the notion that skin color has anything to do with either ambition or character. Now tell me that is not a worthy intent, purpose. We did the book. The rest is history. So writers write towards a goal. I am not saying the goal is always fulfilled. You write with intent, but writing is half the journey. The other half is are people reading them books? <laughs> <laughs> there lies the rub. I share this with you to demonstrate the nature of creative writing as I see it. Now, the question that came about what are writers going to write about post-apartheid, during apartheid, you know, it was almost mandatory that writers be engaged, be, you know, write about, you know, uh, apartheid and how it affected life. And if you were silly enough, I was, to write about just life in general, you were accused of a lot of things. Like you were a fool, you were stupid, you were, you were not even, you were not worthy of being called a writer. It was almost mandatory. Something you had to do as a writer, you would be branded frivolous. But then we also have to re remember that until mid-1980s, when Bo Mandela were getting out of jail, the liberation movements discouraged actively any silly notions like fighting for women's what? You are oppressed. No, forget about that. That's divisive. We must only fight for, you know, racial, or, you know, we must only fight, you see what I mean, where I'm going to? So you, you didn't want to talk about, you know, any other form of oppression. The oppression, the only oppression that mattered was one tied to race and color. It's very unfortunate. Because through our history, we have become addicted to color politics. We, we are addicted to hate. And that shows also through our writing. Writing 
is communication. Writers write because they feel they have something to say. And post-apartheid, I'm taking a broad sweep of time. Anything post-apartheid is, for, I'm not going, there's a, a, a debate currently going on about what's post, what's post, post. I'm just saying anything after the legal apartheid died. There was this euphoria about all these freedoms and people talked about, you know, the rainbow nation, dawn of a new day, da, 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 da. And anybody who appeared not to discern, but not to be holy, 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 like uh, enthusiastic and effervescent. Mm. That was wrong. But following apartheid's uh, a, a, a demise, other forms of oppression gained the right to be openly out and the activists engaged in that had, you know, often used the strategies that the liberation movements had used. And now the liberation movement, including government, couldn't turn against them and say, don't do that because guess what? They had done exactly that. So not only did other forms of oppression get a legitimacy, they also borrowed strategy. So we have sexism being acknowledged, age, ageism, not quite, but it's getting there. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> people living with disabilities or differently abled people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now these people have voices and their voices are loud and clear. I am particularly thrilled because through uh, what is it called? transsexuality or something like that. You know, when, when genres cross, I have had the privilege, the great privilege of getting involved with, um, with a visual artist. And among those, there is the young woman, well, everybody's young from where I'm standing, Zanele Muholi, uh, uh, who is a photographer, but she also writes. And that group of young people who talked about human sexuality that is different to what I grew up with and to what I uh, assumed was the norm. See, now we have the right to, to see, should we so wish, wish, to see and to learn to grow. Because what is human sexuality except what we were taught? There is always boy and girl, man and woman. That's what we thought, and that's what we believed. And for me, it was always right. The first time I encountered anything like, huh? I went into shock. Huh? <laughs> the person hadn't said they wanted anything from me. Huh? Huh? I, <laughs> and if they had, would it have been the first time I had had an, an advance from somebody I didn't fancy? No. What is the response? You say, no, thank you, but thank you. Right? And, and, and this is the time for all of us to learn to see differently. That's all it is. It took me a whole lot of time, almost 20 years. But I have grown, and today I can say to you, I'm a homophile, definitely and decidedly. Yeah? I am a homophile. I, I love everybody. I do not care who you are and what your sexual you know, orientation, none of me business. It's none of my business, is it? And what is more, I support people because I found which is which brings me to the writing. That is one thing to say, I am not against anybody. Do you support them? I found myself after some time that I am a white South African during apartheid. I'm not a racist, but do absolutely nothing to join the fight against apartheid. So, Dazzled by the unexpectedness of the end of apartheid, we went into a great deal of joy. But soon, 
especially after the TRC, they came in a bit of jaundiced uh, view. There was the TRC, a grand spectacle. It didn't touch everybody. And even among those people that it touched, there is some disgruntlement that, then what? We told our story, then what? Again, to go back to mother to mother, if we had been a more open society where we read and when we didn't understand, we began to form liaisons, literary liaisons, where if I read the book and the culture of the writer is different to mine, I should make it my business to make inquiries. How is it in your culture or in, you know, that you see it this way so that we can grow? Unfortunately, as writers, we are still very much in our comfortable skin prisons. We write separately. We haven't embraced the democracy and the formation of a new nation as far as writing is concerned. So, apartheid died and out came a lot of other things, not just the things that are nefarious, the things we do not want, but, and, and the counteract from those things. Now, writers are looking at this new reality, especially after, you know, the uhu went away and we are left with, is this all it means? Especially when we began to see, Uguti, the democracy isn't going to work unless we work at it. And that hasn't happened. Now people are moaning, people are protesting, and we're back to where we were. And, 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 and the writers are taking this into account. The books that are coming out now, books about the violence. Crime writing is one of the most uh, prolific aspect of writing in South Africa, that genre. People are writing, and in fact, writing about crime. I have read somewhere that the authors are hard put to it. You know, when you write, you try to exaggerate reality, right? How can you exaggerate what is happening in South Africa? <laughs> what is happening is gruesome enough, horrendous enough, that now writers are finding it hard to really use their imagination to find more gruesome ways of depicting, because the, you know, realism, you take what is happening and then expand and increase it and make it even more so. You can't make more so with what is happening in the, in, in, in the people are writing about corrective rape. Do you even hear the stupidity of, of juxtaposition of corrective and rape? When can that ever happen? But that's our re reality. When, you know, parents kill children, when mothers maim, maim the babies in their tummies. I mean, can you even get over, when a woman will not just drink, but will take drugs so that the baby she is carrying will be deformed. Guess why? Bigger grant. You have, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. With a little baby, you get 400. With a deformed baby, you get 1,600. Don't go maim your ba babies because of that. That's not the point. The point is for you to be horrified. And why write about that? To point out, to alert, to open eyes to things, because this is not something that is not there. It is there. I, the first time I read this, it was in the, in the community newspaper where I live. Front page, a 16-year-old sitting with a baby. She had maimed deliberately. I used to drink before I got pregnant. She started trying to get pregnant at 13. Had the baby at 16. I used to drink before I got pregnant. Once I got pregnant, I started taking drugs because I wanted this baby to be deformed. 
Now, that's a reality that's there. The social worker was uh, uh, interviewing her, said this is a growing trend in this community. So it's right there. It's not a secret. Are we writers taking this up and expanding the knowledge of the nation so that we begin as a nation to guard against things of that nature, to alert ourselves to the danger. Because what will happen if more and more children are deformed? Are we going to be, a for instance, I mean, without even doing it deliberately? Did you know South Africa leads, leads the whole world uh, with uh, FAS, you know FAS, fetal alcohol syndrome. We are the leaders in the, in the world. So this is what writers are writing about post-apartheid, you know, ways of dying, because it deconstructed the myth of a peaceful transition. Kafka's curse, because it brought out the real story of racial mixing. You know, books like that, welcome to our Hilbro, because it raised awareness about xenophobia and AIDS. The smell of apples, because it showed the perversions of white culture under apartheid. Writers are writing with intent to increase our awareness of ourselves, our knowledge of who we are, so that we may aspire to become better. Because when you know what is not good, hopefully you try and become better. Writers are the heartbeat, heartbeat of the nation. So they are closely linked to the well-being of that nation. Am I going overboard with time? OK. You can always say stop, and I'm easy. Uh, you know, they are the heartbeat of a nation because they lift up the mirror to us all and say, look, listen, this is who we are and it is not good. That is why we are finding, as elsewhere, that writers in South Africa are beginning to look at other ways of depicting what they see. They are running away from the gruesome reality that confronts them. And, 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 and here I'm talking about really the emphasis is on different. They are looking at different realities, speculative fiction might just happen to be where we are headed, where people look at what is happening and say, if this continues, that's the whole point of speculative fiction. If this continues, that's where we will end. Wake up so we don't get there. Uh, Sarah Lotz, crime fiction, she won big prizes. Karen Jane, for the mercy of water, she won a prize, you know, on rape, just a Lauren book, Bukes, Bukes, Moxieland, uh, and these are books that you can get from the library. The libraries like books that win prizes, and you, they're there for, I'm not saying don't buy them, sorry. <laughs> buy books. <laughs> I was told by a writer long before I got to be a writer, and I thought I was, I was paying him a, a compliment. I got you, I'm reading your book. I got it from the library, Richard Reeves. <laughs> I don't get royalties when you get book from <laughs> I shrank. <laughs> but rather than not read me at all, I'm happy if you go to the library. It's better than not reading me at all. But I'm happy, yeah, if you buy the book. <laughs> now, I'm talking about uh, 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 fantasy and speculative. And I got the definition from perhaps the queen of fantasy, the Canadian woman writer, Margaret. Yes. There's a, it's a fine distinction, but it's important for me. Fantasy is some, you know, it couldn't happen. Whereas speculative is something that could happen. It's within the realms of the possible. So, again, the warning for me there, as I read, uh, the authors who have already engaged in, in when, you know, I look at the, 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 the crossover 
into other different, let me say, uh, 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 um, worldviews. Like when a writer who is steeped in, in, in Western mythology writes about African mythology and belief system, do you understand? I'm not saying don't, don't get me wrong. But do you understand it? Because you see, for, for me, when you're going to talk about ancestors, when you're going to talk about that for me is not fantasy. That for me is reality. That's <laughs> <laughs> because that's how we live. You see what I mean? Now, when you write and you call ancestors, you know, fantasy, not, not right. It's not fantasy. Our ancestors live with us. We believe that, don't we? Now, don't try to be UJ very much. ancestors <laughs> then. <laughs> No, no, that's our belief system. When you go on a journey, when something sad happens, you go to them, you, you approach them, you expect, I mean, we feel we are guarded and guided by our ancestors, don't we? So, you see, when I write fantasy, which is what I'm doing, uh, uh, speculative, for me, it's speculative, but it's speculative within the realm of the possibility. That's my next novel, uh, When the Village Sleeps. But, you know, it is based on a reality I believe in. When other people then who are, you know, from the West mostly, right, uh, they are uh, speculative. It's a different kind of speculative. Here, post-apartheid writers post apartheid have distinguished themselves. And I go to a quote by Albie Sachs, who said, the power of art lies precisely in its capacity to expose contradictions and reveal hidden tensions. To expose, you know, contradictions and reveal hidden tensions. This, to me, is huge. There is a lot of flowery weddings and, 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 you know, words that are poured out, especially by politicians, all politicians. Right now, my big beef is help. I want to compare help traditionally in the village and help today. What is help? What should it mean? What does it mean? What did it mean? Then you know when, whether you are being helped. Okay? So, the political is there, but all writing is political. It doesn't matter what you write about, it is political. Writers have the f freedom of choice, and our writers are experiencing that. The literature post-apartheid has been astounding in terms of volume. However, when I read the criticism, it seems uh, we are a bit lacking in the imagination. But as I said earlier, perhaps the reality is so gruesome, we have not managed quite, I'm not saying there are no books that transcend our reality, to force us to look beyond today and imagine a tomorrow that's better, that's different, that is more humane. We need to go towards that. We need to story ourselves, to story ourselves into a realization that A, we are a nation, one nation, and B, we are responsible for what becomes of us today and tomorrow. Sadly, as I said earlier, our writing and the agents of that writing, the writers, have not managed to get out of our own skins so that we write across skin color, across tradition, and across language. How can we hope to ever knit into a nation? if we keep writing separately. Apartheid is gone. 
it lives very much in our writing. And a path it is gone, it is up to us as writers to begin to do what we are meant to do, to lead the way towards real freedom, where everybody understands what freedom is and what their role is in maintaining and growing that freedom. Freedom is not something like a blanket I can come and put on you. You work for your freedom. You work for your freedom like you work for what you want. The village taught us that. The village taught us that, you know, agency. It's a shame that when we are now free to make our lives to be the best they can be on earth and to become, as a nation, a beacon to the world, that difference is nothing because different coloration is less than 1% of your DNA. Color is less than 1% of who you are. It cannot determine your destination. Do not, do not be bamboozled by history, the history of hate, the history of race. That's a myth. You are a human being complete, as good as any other human being. And that's something we, the writers, have to knit into realization so that we tell stories that enable South Africa, South Africa that has been groaning for 25 years to give birth to itself. It's a challenge. And I am quite capable, quite, com you know, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Confident. See, English is not my mother tongue. I am quite confident that we have excellent writers, we have brains, we have souls in this country who are going to come to the fore and help us mend and help us heal so that every child in this country grows up not dreaming of where they are, as well in her, in her manners, or a, what is another? Yeah, or a, you know, people dream, but they can't dream better dreams if they're surrounded by nonsense. We need to plant those dreams even in children. We need to find ways of getting those kids out for a reprieve, even if it's a week or a month, such that people begin to grow dreams that take them out of gloom and doom. Thank you. Oh, that was so amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sindiwe Magona. And uh, so what's going to happen next is um, Professor uh, Sylvia Vollenhofen and Professor Pumla Dileo Gola will um, give their responses, um, five to 10 minutes each, just your, your thoughts on uh, what um, Dr. Magona had to say. And then uh, we will do a Q&A and open it to the floor. Uh, so while you gather your thoughts, I'd just like to give my responses briefly, if I may. <laughs> I'm a military critic myself, and um, I'm in I'm in agreement uh, with with everything you've said, um, uh, Dr. Magona. And um, speaking towards you know the social realism that you know that that South African writers are dealing with, because you can't make this ish up, right? Um, there's also a movement towards a kind of magical realism, right? When you look at uh, the works of uh, people like Zakaria Rapola, and Nick Mklongo uses magical realism in his uh, novel Way Back Home, and, um, and Mohale Mashiro, who's actually a UJ uh, Prize recipient, if I'm not mistaken, for The Yearning. And I want to um, also you know, reiterate that, yes, we, the thing is we can't afford to buy books, so we need to use libraries, and then the libraries will buy books. Because if we use the libraries, then our authors uh, actually make more royalties. Because if every single library was to buy you know, several copies of, 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 of books that we can all use, they actually the, the, the authors will get more royalties than if a handful of us you know, um, try and purchase books. And you know that um, um, one of the major booksellers, they were talking about how 
they decided to re-merchandise the, the, the book space, right? So the South African literature and the African literature sort of came into the forefront. And they said, they, they told me that, you know, Karabu, the problem is that um, the most shoplifted books are by South African writers. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a problem, yeah. Yeah, they, they shoplifted. So I, I think that it's important that we use the libraries because the libraries will buy the books. And if you don't return the books, the libraries will just buy more books. And, you know, I'm not saying steal the books from the library, but. <laughs> But I was so, I was absolutely delighted because I, I use the library. I mean, I, I can't, if I, all my money was, if all my money was to go to literature, then I wouldn't eat, right? Um, so I used the library at work. And I was so delighted when I was, I was taking out a copy of The Yearning. And I found one of um, our authors, and her book is not a literary work, right? It's popular fiction, Angela Makolwa's uh, 30th Candle. And there were six copies on the shelf. And I was like, yeah, snap, you know? So it's really important that we use our libraries because the libraries, you know, then the university management will approve the budgets because if you don't use the library, then the library gets less money and then they're not able to buy our literature. So I really encourage you to use your libraries, go to your community libraries, ask them to order the books. You know, we need to put that pressure on because we can't afford to buy the books. And that's why, you know, we, we pay all these taxes so that the libraries can sort of pick that up. And um, I also want to speak a little bit to, um, to looking at transformation um, and how, you know, um, you know, sexual evolution and revolution, um, this young person had to, um, had to explain to her bonus mom, I learned that word from a Swedish TV show <laughs> called A Bonus Family, which instead of using the word step family, you use bonus, right? And she was speaking to her bonus mom and she's, she's a lesbian girl. And the bonus mom asked her, um, so who's the boy in your relationship? She's like, well, the point is that there's no boys in the relationship. <laughs> Why are you thinking like that? It's two girls, you know? And um, looking at Zanella Moholi's work and, you know, what happened when she had, a, she had an exhibition at uh, the Constitutional Court and the Deputy Minister of Arts and Culture actually said that, you know, who she is is immoral. <laughs> and she actually walked out of the exhibition. And I mean, that, that's, that's a disaster. You know, when you have patriarchal princesses in, in government who are supposed to be serving our interests as women, we need to speak truth to that power, right? And um, what I also really appreciate is the work of uh, somebody like Landa Mabenge, who wrote uh, Becoming Him, uh, which is a book about his, his, his transition, uh, because he was born, he was born cis female, and, um, and now he was able to win a, court case, win a case where the medical aid um, had to pay for, for, his, for his transitioning. And, and that's also a very important piece of work so we need to we need to keep writing ourselves into existence to quote uh, a Bantu book festival and uh, what what our authors are doing is is very important and you know the imagination is there um, we do understand you know the criticism is valid but you also need to be responsible with our criticism that we don't kill the dreams of our writers because they already live under such precarious conditions so we need to also you know have have, a, have an element of care you know we have a duty and i'm speaking as a literary journalist uh, to, to to create an environment where we can critique but we do it with respect and realize that we're also nurturing the dreams of the future and we're nurturing the dreams of 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 young people as well so um thank you so much dr cindy wamagona for for, for 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 such a beautiful keynote address uh, now i'd like to introduce uh, Professor Sylvia Vollenhofen, who is a writer, award-winning journalist, and filmmaker. In 2019, she was appointed the University of Johannesburg's first ever Professor of Practice. So, so that's a combination of, you know, lofty ideals, realizing them and putting them to work. And, and, and that's, you know, that, that, is, that is something really to celebrate, right? And um, her feature film, uh, in development, Buckingham Palace District 6 won three awards, jury prize, first prize, and audience award at the prestigious Toronto International Film Festival in, um, in 2019 and the 2019 Big Pitch. She also received the South Africa Canada Accelerator Award at the 2019 Durban International Film Festival, which is one of my favorite festivals ever. She's co-director and essay producer for the feature film, uh, documentary film Josie Gold, which opened to acclaim at the 21st Encounters Film Festival 2019. It's a co-production with WG Film in Sweden and Santa Nusant in Norway and looks at the environmental disaster left behind by declining gold mining industry. She also produced the BBC miniseries Mandela the Living Legend, a play based on the life of writer Richard Reeve. Uh, she she co-authored My, Bucky, uh, My Word Redesigning Buckingham Palace, which was uh, chosen to, for a run on London's West End and for the main program at the South African National Arts Festival. When do you even find the time to teach? 
<laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness. She was chair of the 2018 and 2019 Alan Payton Lipsy Award Jury and a member of the International Emmy Awards 2018 Jury and is a Knight Fellow who led a project to improve coverage of poverty and development issues in Ghana for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. In the early 90s, uh, she was the Southern African correspondent for the Swedish newspaper Expressen and was awarded Sweden's top journalism prize. And uh, what I really enjoyed, I actually read... Um, a paper that you wrote in the 80s, uh, looking at you know what's at stake um, and and why you know apartheid needs to fall and black opposition to apartheid and you looked at the the issue of you know um, it was called a new kind you spoke about a new kind of crossroads black exclusion from society you were speak you were speaking to service delivery protests at the time but then you know you fast forward to today we're having the service delivery protests that black children were dissatisfied with the education system that was that was set up to to, to, to perpetually subjugate them and this is what young people are protesting about today uh, unemployment violence um, insufficient health care you know um, and, and that paper I think it was in the 80s um, and I was reading it three days ago, and it was, I mean, 30 years ago, and it's still applicable today, you know, which is, which is, kind, of, which is kind of unsettling. But um, uh, please do look it up. It's, it's, I think it's, it's, in a, it's in a journal. It's in a scholarly journal. But I, I found that really, really interesting that you were able to sort of see, you were speaking about a present, which is now, you know, the, the future is, is still we're still there but at the same time there's so much to look forward to and so much to be hopeful about because there has been work that has been produced and from 30 years ago to today you've also produced an impressive body of work that we can continue to get uh you know to be encouraged by and also thank you for being a role model you're one of the reasons why i decided to become a journalist <laughs> please come to the stage professor sylvia volunteer Thank you for that amazing introduction, Karabo. <laughs> um, I'm going to pick up on just a few things that the keynote speaker said, and I sat there quite entranced, but I'm always entranced by Cindy Wimagona. I, I met her the first time in New York, and she was with the U UN radio at the time, many, many years ago. And um, I remember meeting her and being so angry because I was angry at the amount of talented South Africans I was meeting all over the world as journalists who were forced to live outside of this country. And it made me extremely excited to meet Cindywe, but also angry at the same time. Um, I'm so happy she mentioned Richard Reeve uh, because Richard was, <laughs> and just that intimidation that crept into her voice when she recalled that story. Richard was my Latin teacher at high school, and uh, that intimidation lives in my head. Um, I, a lot of my work that I've done looks at his life and, and his work, and as, as Karabo has just mentioned. So from what Cindy has said, I'm going to pick up on two things which I think is, is extremely important and what the previous speakers also addressed briefly. And the one is the role of women in literature, and the other is the voices of the youth. And I'm so happy to see so many young people here this afternoon. Um, as head of the Alan Payton jury for the last two years, I had to evaluate um, 50 South African creative nonfiction books. And that, you know, in the beginning, it feels like hard work. But, but as I got into it each time, I realized it is such a privilege to have to sit down and, and be disciplined to not just read these works, but look at what are they saying about the society in which I live. And a nation is like a large extended family. And our collective health as a nation, as individuals, is dependent on those among us who are the guardians of our precious and intangible heritage. And these are our storytellers and our artists. Um, I'm going to just climb right in with, with a young woman whom I admire greatly, Panache Chigumadzi, who has written a book called These Bones Will Rise Again. And she says, history is like water. It lives between us and comes to us in waves. At times, it is still and unobtrusive. And at others, it is turbulent and threatening. And so we are always living in the tension between water's tranquility and it's tumult. And I think for a 26-year-old to write like that makes me thoroughly embarrassed. Um, 
a few trends in nonfiction writing, and I'm going to focus on nonfiction mainly because I come from a very strong journalistic background, and even the, the fiction that I've written is more like faction, and most of my work has been documentary storytelling um, and, and journalism. Um, so a few trends in nonfiction writing in the past few years point to the bigger picture of the meaning and purpose of literature in, in post-94 South Africa. I wouldn't say it's post-apartheid. Um, it's inspiring to notice, for instance, that out of the 25 books on the 2018 long list for Alan Payton, eight were written by women. And I was kind of encouraged by that. But then this year, about half of the authors were female. And, and I, I think being a strong black female voice on, on that, um, in, in that institution for two years, really helped and you can see when you go into these organizations and institutions that it is not true that the best people are being chosen and it is not true that they have to make allowances or compromise when they are choosing women or when they're choosing black people but what is true that whether people are black and white they come out of a certain paradigm they grow up in a certain way and they read work in a certain way and they appreciate work in a certain way and all of that has to be addressed when you go into to juries and committees and and award uh, um processes. Um, writers that, that I, I've looked at via these works are exploring such diverse issues that, that affect us all. Top of the list a lot of the time is corruption, but then close to that is the land question. There were books written about things like parliament poaching, spousal abuse, of course investigations into crime. Um, but then there was also the history and significance of the Boer War, or the history of Kwaito that, that I really, really enjoyed. Um, an important, important assertion from one shortlisted author is that the Rainbow Nation is seriously wounded, or maybe even dead. The fallest generation is holding up unforgiving mirrors. We are no longer basking in that indulgent glow of a post-liberation society. One young writer interrogates recent history from a female and spiritual perspective, and that really made me sit up and take notice. Some of them were delving into intensely personal spaces like, for instance, the horror of the apartheid prisons, um, to a search for meaning of a great Southern African spiritual warrior. So when we're looking for solutions to the national problems, we need to start with the personal, and South African writers are definitely helping us do that. The works that stood out for me in recent years are intensely personal accounts that help us understand the bigger picture. And one of those that I will single out is Color Me Yellow, Searching for My Family Truth by Tulian Schlapo. It is chilling. The author takes you deep into the intense cruelty that growls around in some ordinary families. She writes about her close relatives and she uses a technique writing about these people who are so close to her in the third person. And this technique, coupled with the rest of her style, that places her in an observer position while at the same time being an insider torn apart by this cruelty, makes it so powerful. It is the essential journey in search of who she is, gripping, heartfelt, and resonated with me because most of my ancestry and history has been called, recorded so haphazardly. And, and it is, it is this, this haphazard or distortion of my personal and, and, and collective history has inspired me to, to write the book that I wrote, the, the Keeper of the Kum, because I just found I was nowhere in this South African history, and, and that has a profound effect on people and communities. The other book that, that stood out for me, and this one above all else, was, is These Bones Will Rise Again by Panashe Chigumadzi. And she says, she, as I said earlier, she was only 26, year old at, 26 years old at the time of, of writing the book. She draws on memory and myth to craft an alternative past, present, and future. And I think for any writer, that is such an ambitious thing to do, to go back to memory and myth and to use intuition and say, 
The past that we have been told is our history is unacceptable. Let's recraft that because we need a better present and we need a better future. And she successfully does that. It's a story that goes beyond the superficial nature of events. The focus is the several incarnations of Zimbabwe's wars of liberation, the first, second, third, Chimurenga, etc. And it's way more than just a memoir. She weaves her personal stories into an account that helps us make sense of the modern Zimbabwe and helps us make sense of ourselves at the same time. In search of the meaning of the great spiritual warrior Mbuya Nihanda, she takes us literally and figuratively deep into a Zimbabwe that most outsiders do not know and many do not even care about. And a Zimbabwe that is not unlike South Africa or many other African countries in this regard. The story is a powerful reminder that we should stop collaborating with narratives that reduce Africans to caricatures and stereotypes, lacking in depth and cultural identity. Whether we're turning on Netflix and Showmax or picking up a book in, or a magazine, we have to understand the, the level of our collaboration when we are consuming foreign stories. Um, it is a clever book and in some way she juxtaposes the new political portraits going up everywhere in Zimbabwe with personal family photos that have been lost to reimagine her country. It's a radical reimagination, sorry, it's a radical reimagining of ourselves and the modern state. There are such lovely turns of phrase that she uses like, we can barely hear ourselves through the noise of our daily struggles or in search of answers, I must lower my eyes from the heights of big men who have created, who have created a history that not, does not know little people, let alone women, except as cannon fodder. She writes of ancestral spirits returning again and again. We are, as she says, haunted by the spirits of all those whose blood have been shed. The importance of the combination and of the spiritual the combination of the spiritual and aggression or warfare is emphasized over and over. She writes, spirit possession is at the heart of Chimurenga. It is an exercise in timelessness. It is those in the present communing with those in the past about the future concerning those who will come. Chimurenga has always been the intergenerational spirit of African self-liberation. It is not linear. It is bones that go into the earth and rise again and again. Powerful writing by these guardians of our historic moments and storytelling that lingers. Now, if we only listen to our hearts more readily than our heads, and if only we were guided by our artists rather than bankers and politicians, just imagine. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Wallenhofen. And uh, Panache really called our generation to order. I'm the generation who was born late 70s, early 80s. Uh, when she gave the Ruth first lecture, and she said, you know, we're collaborators. And um, she speaks truth to that, because we're the generation that was told, you know, we're the rainbow kids, let's assimilate, right? Uh, but nobody, Nobody came to, you know, to, to our side. We had to learn the English, we had to put our heads down, become the first black, whatever, 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 and then close the door behind us. So you know, she speaks like a really powerful truth to our generation where we have to think twice. Like, you know, what is our responsibility uh, in terms of you know, collaborating with these power structures um, instead of actually trying to dismantle this stuff? So um, yeah, that's incredibly powerful. And uh, now um, we're going to um, get a response uh, from a Professor Pumla Dineo Gol who's a gender activist, award-winning author, and dean of research at the University of Fort Hare. She was previously professor in the Department of African Literature at the University of the Witwatersrand, um, and chief research specialist on societies, cultures, and identities program at the Human Sciences Research Councillor, and senior lecturer at the University of Free State's Department of English and Classical Culture. Her research foci are slave memory in the African world. That's how I got to know your, your, first, your first book, What is Slavery to Me? I think I, I was like the first person to interview on that book, ne? And I've been a fan ever since, so I'm incredibly biased. <laughs> and um, she, she looks um, at slave memory in the African world, black consciousness literature, womanism and feminist literary studies, post-colonialism, post-apartheid public culture, African feminist sexualities, and rape. Her book, Rape, a South African Nightmare, won the 2016 Alan Payton Award for Nonfiction. 
And you know, uh, when she writes about the female fear factory, um, I'm wearing a purple ribbon. I'm dressed in black and purple on purpose uh, because a lot of a lot of our oeuvre in terms of when you speak about post ninety four. Um, Literature in South Africa is uh, speaking truth to the nightmare that it, that it is to be a woman in this society, and how we live with tension and fear all the time. You know, when you greet people, when you greet men, because you're scared that they might come back at you, so you're asking for permission just 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 to move. You know, uh, greeting security guards, uh, being scared of young men on campus. When I when the lifts open and I just see young men, I actually pretend I forgot something in the office and I take the stairs. You know, um, so and this is our reality. We're, we're, we're just we're terrified all the time. So the female fear factory, I think it's a, it's a big part of um, how we live in it, not just in South Africa, but South, South Africa, I always say South Africa, we're, we're really good at it. Like if, if we're not really, really good at stuff, we are shockingly horrible at it. So we are a good example or like the worst warning ever. And unfortunately, you know, occupying this body with this color in this society is, it's, it's insane. It, you know, it taxes your mental health on the daily and every moment. But um, let's have your response. <laughs> uh, Professor Pumlandineo Gola. And um, yeah, you've got your 10 minutes. Thank you, Karabo. Um, and good afternoon. Thank you, DVC Sina, for that warm welcome. It's good to see you again at a different academic event. Um, thank you for hosting us. Thank you, Dr. Bongani Ngulunga, who's left, I think. Oh, no, there. Um, and, 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 and your staff from JIAS uh, for hosting us, uh, Reshmi Singh and all your other um, colleagues. Ambassador Julian, it's wonderful to see you again um, um, at another panel where um, hopefully we, or at another event where hopefully we, you, you and I are um, both two part of a team of feminist troublemakers. Um, it's wonderful to have a troublemaking feminist ambassador. <laughs> Mr. Sommel, thank you very much. Dr. Damons from the NRF. Um, and also a special thank you to Lira Dom Petra um, from the NRF, whose life I did not make very, it's always a little tricky to arrange my travel arrangements. But thank you so much for being so generous and so kind and so patient with me. And my apologies. And of course, the staff at the UJ Library who are hosting us in this in this beautiful beautiful event, um, and and thank you everybody for coming, um, colleagues, students. I'm going to okay. So let me get to it. It's always a bit tricky to be the last person to speak on a topic, but let's see what we can do. Um, although it's always wonderful to listen to Cindy Wemakona, um, who has been a central part of both my, I mean, I, 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 it's very hard for me to imagine growing into adulthood without um, her, her, her work because she starts, I start reading her um, when her first, um, auto, the, the, her first autobiography came out as a, as, as a student myself and I have continuously read her across genre, autobiography, short stories, essays, and um, I read her children's book to my child every night, every other night. Um, well, I didn't just read Makona, but I read a lot of Makona. Um, and of course, it's a delight now that he, at 11, comes back and is now reading Makona himself in both English and Kosa as part of his, um, a part of his own voc um, curriculum. So it's always wonderful to listen to listen to her. And I, unlike Garabo and Sylvia, don't entirely agree with her <laughs> reading of post apartheid South African literature. Um, I do partly. I mean, I think that I agree, obviously, um, both as a writer and as a professor of literature, that stories matter. And that stories do so much more than what we often limit them to in public discussions about literary worlds in South Africa um, to say that they reflect and they describe. Stories do so much more than describe and reflect. 
And I agree with her that writers write toward a goal, that it's intentional. And like her, I agree that intentional is not the same thing as saying that we, as readers, have to be obsessed with the intention of the reader, the writer. That the intention of the reader is important. The intentionality is important, but the intention is, well, it's important, but it's also actually completely irrelevant to our purposes as readers. Right, because literary works do their own work, and sometimes they do work that exceeds the intentions of the readers, as they must. And sometimes, sadly, they fall short of the reader's um, intentions and intentionality. And so intention and intentionality, uh, a very useful tension. Um, but I, I, you know, I also agree that, of course, writing happens because scribes have something to say. And I think this is something that we do not pause to reflect on enough in post apartheid in South Africa, um, in a society where one of the shifts between how South Africans think in the literary, in the various overlapping literary worlds, think about literature um, has shifted quite significantly, whereas under apartheid, as she correctly points out, the pressure was to write political writing and to recognize that writing is always political, even when it says it is not political. To post about date predominantly the recognition, the, 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 the refusal to recognize that, that, that creative text, that literature matters. To increasingly the expectation that literature is to provide some form of reprieve. And so it seems to me that in fact, Literature is, post-apartheid, has very often been an invitation to avoid averting our eyes. We've seen significant shifts in the kinds of topics, the kinds of areas, the kinds of treatments that writers have bravely invited to explore. We've seen, for example, significant shifts post-apartheid in who the face of South African poetry is. Under, under apartheid, the face of poetry is a black man. Post-apartheid, bizarrely, wonderfully, incredibly, strangely, the face of apartheid is a feminist black woman. What did I say? <laughs> the face of poetry, not of apartheid. Oh my God. Is that what I said? No, 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 no. <laughs> Through a variety of things that people, literary scholars, have spent. Let me say that again. Quite. So, under apartheid, the face of South African poetry is a, a disaffected political black man. The face of poetry in South Africa, through a variety of, 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 of deliberate, intentional um, marry, forms that marry both the structure and the space creation and the kinds of content um, poetry takes on has become a young, feminist black woman of poetry, not of apartheid. <laughs> because literature is always, always about, not only about the difficult, but it is also always about the possible. I mean, I'm often struck and I'm often frustrated as someone who's a deep lover of literature and who, who chose a life um, of, of, of a life of, of a, a, a career path that is a lifelong um, engagement with works of the imagination by how much, how, many, how often we turn away from what's the, the literariness, the, 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 the fact of literature being something that is, that creates something in the world. And so I'm delighted to be on a panel today of people who have multiple relationships to literary worlds. Because I think post-apartheid South African literature has increasingly invited, seduced, prodded us to turn our gaze towards the difficult. What does it mean to be writing possibility in the works of someone like Lebu Mashile, who imagines that we have to think about not just the difficult, and the impossible, but also joy, accountability. What does it mean to think about the ribbon of rhythm as 
that as, as, as this mobile imagination through the works of essayist, literary scholar, film scholar, poet extraordinaire, Habib, Habib Abadarun. What does it mean to think about how meaning leaks across boundaries that we perhaps would prefer that they do not? And of course, I particularly like this metaphor that she, that she that, that comes from one of her poems, this leaking of meanings, because I think it is a particularly feminine and feminist metaphor, right? Leakings of all, of, 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 of all kinds are quite evocative and powerful and threatening. And so I think it's a particularly um, important metaphor and orientation to, 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 the, to the imagination. Or to think about a writer um, such as Tandom Kolozan, whose work has continuously across three novels, but also in the role he's played in shaping and intervening into receptions and circulations of literary texts. So not only forcing us to have really conversations that we sometimes would rather not have around the making of masculinities. You have in a novel, his first novel, A Man Who's Not a Man, that what people often want to think is an easier novel than it is. So if we think it's about Ulwa Lugo, then we think it's an easy novel, but actually it's a novel that forces us to think about masculinity through, within, outside, but to think about masculinity and desire and relationships between different kinds of masculinity in ways that we often in post-apartheid South Africa don't want to think about. To think about pleasure alongside pain, to think about becoming alongside difficulty. To think about what, it, what, 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 what masculinity and difficulty and possibility and friendship has to do with achievement. Or in a non-fiction in the, in, in the, in the in the, in the Reedy Tlaibi book that won the Alan Payton the year before I did, um, Big Endings and Beginnings, to think even, as those of us who are feminists, to think about what implication and complication and complicity or entanglement means when you are a public figure who speaks against rape, but also loved very deeply as a girl, a man who was a rapist. Right? So certainly, I mean, just from these examples, and I could go on and on, it seems to me that this idea that literature, South African post-apartheid literature, is a place of retreat away from um, is either willful ignorance or just a deliberate refusal. I'm not, I'm not saying that's what she's saying. I'm saying the, 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 the common, um, that's not where I disagree with her. I'm coming to where I disagree with her. <laughs> <laughs> Or when we look at the fantastically beautiful but haunting novel by Barbara Boswell, Grace, which is not just about an exposition of gender-based violence and the making sense of it, but is really an invitation to journey into the geography of, of, of gender psychically. Or Vana, who says, who insists, Zugiswa Vana, who insists that comfort and ease and desire and frivolity and play are important considerations for a literary imagination. Snaker, Fiona Snaker, who in Lacuna most specifically, but in her earlier literary conversations earlier too, um, forces us to think about what it means when novels, novelists write back to traditions and vocabularies and possibilities presented in other writers' works. So Lacuna is very often read as a response to Kutzia's disgrace. And in some ways it is, and in other ways it is it isn't. Sylvia uh, um, Ballenhoven has already spoken about, spoken quite powerfully about creative nonfiction, so perhaps I'll, 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 I'll then limit um, what I wanted to say about, about creative nonfiction. But I do think that creative nonfiction is the genre in South African letters, post-apartheid, that we pay the least attention to. I think the vast majority of, 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 of nonfiction in, is, is, is continues to be biography. And there often seems an unease, a dis-ease, a difficulty in recognizing um, the flourishing and the certainly growing body of, of, of creative nonfiction. I'm, 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 I'm thinking specifically, I mean, of a whole range of people, but I'll, I'll just throw a few names at you. The, 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 the brilliant poet, but also ex like the, 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 who's an essayist as well, Rastam Kozain's essays, which, whose musicality jumps off the page. 
but that we often read as analysis of something else that is, and, and, and we miss the creativity. I'm thinking also of a Angelo Fix prose, his essays that are elegant, even when they, when, when infused with rage. Or Chris Van Veyck, who could forget Chris Van Veyck? Um, a great love of mine, both as a reader and as a, as a, as a, as a literary scholar, who is disruptive both under apartheid as a significant figure, but who brings us surely goodness and mercy that breaks all rules about anything, about how you write about black life, how you think about black life, how you do the political and playful at the same time. And of course, who, whose play adaptation of, of, of surely goodness and mercy breaks even the, breaks every record about, uh, uh, every record and every expectation of how readers buy, read, or attend theatrical performances. And this is where, and finally, I'm just going to say one more thing because I'm sure I'm out of time. So this is where I disagree. And now you're all going to think, that's all. She played it up so much, and that's it. <laughs> so Cindy Emma presents us towards the end of her fantastic, amazing keynote with the image of the young woman who deliberately ingests certain substances with, in order to deliberately maim the fetus while she is pregnant. And of course, I, it, this is a shocking image as it should be. But I wonder whether the real value in that story is less shock at a specific woman behaving in these ways that are unconventional and frightening and, 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 and more an invitation to think about the kind of society, environment, that makes this a possibility. She's just pretending that's not what she said. <laughs> you are all here and there's evidence, there's a recording. And so I'm often struck, for example, and I return to her point, that stories matter. I'm often struck and, to be quite honest, enraged by the circulating narrative about how black women, how poor black women post-apartheid work so in deliberately fall pregnant, deliberately infect themselves with HIV as a way to inappropriately and illegitimately access state resources. And how this narrative is really a narrative about shame. Shalja Patel, the fantastic, brave, radical Kenyan feminist who has been exiled from Kenya for refusing to apologize for naming a literary figure for sexually assaulting her. And for refusing, after he successfully sues her and wins, to pay him or apologize as the court demands and, 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 and goes into exile instead, told us long before this instance that if you follow the shame so when you pay attention to the stories, if you follow the shame, you know who the story, who the society considers disposable. And so to say the story matters, it is important to think about the stories we tell about poor black women and poor black men. It's important to pay attention to what those stories, so beyond the disapproval at what people are doing, and some of these stories, in fact, not this one about the maiming, but many of the stories, for example, that circulate are simply fictional and rumor anyway. But stories always tell us something about our society. And unlike Makona, I am not always convinced that the most important thing about, or one of the most important thing about stories and about writers and about literature is the duty to heal. In fact, I think, and I think her work in this case, a beautiful, fantastic body of work in this case, 
mm, sits oddly and slightly in argument with, with the argument she made, she made in her keynote. I think the most important contribution literature has is to discomfort and to show the wounds and sometimes to pour salt in the wound in order to illuminate. And then finally, another aspect on which I disagree. I'm not sure. I think, OK, maybe I'm being a little defensive on this one. But you know, as a literary scholar and as a professor of literature, even though that's not what I'm doing now temporarily, I am absolutely convinced that I, there is outstanding literary scholarship and criticism in this country. Yes. When I think about the work of Grace Musila, the literary scholarship of Grace Musila, or a Peggy Zizwe Peterson, or a Pier Paolo Frasnelli, who is at UJ and in the audience, um, literary scholarship that not only is attentive and imaginative, but that honestly is often a joy to read. One of my mentors, David Dabedin, who's a professor of literature and a multiple award-winning poet and novelist himself, often said to me, it is an insult when we as literary scholars write of literary scholarship without ourselves trying to produce rigorous, intellectually rigorous and, and searing work, but that is also joyful to read. And so I just wanted to end on that note and say I derive much pleasure from, from some of the scholarship that is coming out on um, post apartheid South Africa. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Gola. And um, I do agree with you on your point of disagreement uh, because um, I actually. On, on, <laughs> grab the mic. <laughs> is, is the mic on? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> no, I have to make something clear. I didn't finish my argument. <laughs> Finally, in the novel, when the village sleeps, I am not indicting the mother. I am indicting the, the system that makes a woman make that decision. What kind of people are we? What kind of society are we that a poor woman has to resort to, to that? That's, but you do so that I, I, all the time, just your keynotes that went the Okay, the keynote was <laughs> rotten. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right, uh, we're running out of time, so um, I'm going to take um, only three questions, unfortunately. Um, who, who's got, yeah, just three, because um, Prof has got a plane to catch, and you know, we need to, yeah. So, um, Rose, roving mic, uh, one. Anyone from that? So, okay, so. You th what are three questions from one table? <laughs> well, no one else is raising their hands, so. The Was there someone at the back? Okay, so we'll do one, two, three, four. All right, okay. Make it five. Should I make five? Who's, who, who's the one more? Okay. Can I? Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. Um, Please Mama? keep it brief. Oh, okay, I'll be, try and be as brief as possible. I'd like to make some objective opinions also, so. I like the fact that you said we are African, you touched on the Afri Afrocentric being in us. That made me more African, thank you very much. First question is, as a literature person. It's one question per person, please. Ooh. Yeah, it's one question per person. I, it's time, I, sorry, I have to be that, I have to be okay. that person. Okay, uh, this is the most important question of all my questions. Sure. So what's your take on teaching kids in, let's say, um, the method of teaching, because you've, I'm, I, I do science, I'm, I'm a science student, and I've noticed that a lot of people are very good at maths and physical application, uh, like things that need application, but there are kids who don't know English at all, but they are very good at maths. So what's your take on that in terms of sort of like decolonizing in the way they teach us because it's the, the medium of, of teaching is strictly English. Okay. So you, I don't know, maybe, yeah, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I think I'm right because everything that I'm saying, <laughs> everything that I'm saying is from experience because- All right, time up. 
Next one, next, next question. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Sandy Lentuli from UJFM. Um, my question relates to a genre that I'm enjoying very much at the moment, historical fiction. So uh, Fred Kumara is the only uh, South African writer who is pursuing it from what I can tell, um, Dancing the Death Drill and uh, The Long March, his latest one. Please can you share with me if you know of any other historical fiction writers in South Africa so that we can support them and also your thoughts on the genre and telling our stories as well. Thank you. I can mention two quickly, Marguerite Poland, uh, Sin of Omission, and Lori Kubitzile, um, what's, what's the name of Lori Kubitzile's book? Um, yeah, they, um, but Deliver Us From Evil. Those are two historical fiction. Yeah. Sin of Omission. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Sandy as well. Mama, ma go on. Yeah. Bing, ma... <laughs> Bing, mam tolo, ne? Yes, you would know that you are a descendant of Amaziz. <laughs> and myself being, being with our two chambers, I'm also a descendant of Amaziz. Now, there's this thing of languages in South Africa. So we are told that there's 11 official languages, but there's not 11 languages in the country, there's more. So Amaziz themselves, they have their own language. But uh, the problem is, these languages are not even recognized. Are we not now uh, conveying a message that they are not as important, they are not... Uh, because they are not part of the constitution, including other Khoisan languages. So my, my point, my question is, how are we going to preserve now our heritage if we, these languages are not recognized, they're not promoted, there's no writings in our ancient languages. So how, what are we doing? Are we promoting some languages on top of others? Are we promoting the sense of superiority of other languages uh, other than others? And Mama, you spoke about uh, offense and you know putting a salt. No, you said talk about putting a salt on the wound. I like that because you smashed and grabbed. I said one question per person. I'm sorry. I have to be that guy. <laughs> Bye. I, I have. Yeah. That, that's that's why my job is tough. <laughs> um, two more. Two more questions. Okay. Hi. Uh, yes. My name is Tulane uh, from the Department of Anthropology. Uh, like literature being a wound opener and a healer, I find that very utilitarian. What about literature for literature's sake? And I think it is bordering on utilitarian fascism. <laughs> yeah. Great. And then last one, and then um, our panel will respond. There was one more question. Are we done? Okay, great. Would you like to respond? Okay. Um, Memory being what it is, at my age, I can't remember the first no question. Problem. Scientist, uh, he's uh, working with maths, and the children are really good at maths, but they're struggling with English. Yeah, the so thing looking is, at mother tongue and issues yeah, of language, basically. I am, rather, I am rather biased. I, I no longer teach. I used to teach a long time ago. If it were up to me, uh, if I were in government and had anything to do with the teaching of children, children wouldn't go to school and choose mother tongue. I think it is quite, really, how do you choose mother tongue? Science tells us that a child learns or recognizes the sounds the mother makes in utero. That is the language, something is knitting up here, I'm not a scientist. So that this is the language the child is most fitted to master. So for me, I believe that Education should be mother tongue based. We, we buy cars. We buy cars made by Italians, made by Germans who speak not a word of English. But they understand the concept because they don't have to talk along the way. They just, you know, they learn what they are learning in mother tongue. You know, we confuse English with knowledge. English is language. Learn knowledge in your mother tongue. Learn English as a subject. Um, so historical fiction, you were given some examples. Yvette Christiansen. Um, I think Zix does Heart of Redness. Yeah. Um, Andre Brink wrote a lot of historical fiction. Um, that's just off the top of my head. I'm sure as soon as I get in my shuttle, I'm going to think about 20 male people. Is it not on? It is on. No, yes. Can you not hear me? <laughs> you J people give you a mic in your chair, in your seat, and then they say, go stand there. <laughs> but it's okay. I did anywhere. So, um, so Sandy, let me, I'll think of, I'll think of more. Um, 
And then Sandile number two, <laughs> I don't know, you weren't able to finish your question, but it had something to do with what I said about wound and salt. Um, and I think it also kind of combines with the question that um, Tulani asked, although I wonder if Tulani is being serious about his, about his question, because certainly all of us talked about how um, literature and writing does whatever it, it, it and, and all of us talked about a range of things that literature, that literature does. Certainly, I think one of the things that we all agreed on was the way in which literature does a range of things. So I'm not sure where he got the prescription for utilitarianism and literature should do this and should do that. We all, I mean, certainly, and, 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 and several of us mentioned various writers who were doing a whole range of things. And of course, we can't sit here and talk about every single writer and how it's, you know, the, 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 they, and, and, and what exactly each one seems to be doing. And of course, even the ones that we flagged and talked about, um, we picked one thing that they may or may not be doing. And, I, and, and, and so, no, I mean, I certainly don't think any, I think one of the things that we, all, we, we probably do agree on is, is, is that literature does, and writers should be able to write about whatever they want to write about, for whatever, whatever the intentionality is. Mm. And that's why it was so important for me to make the distinction between Magona's intentionality and often the much easier thing that we go to, which is intention. And also then to make that distinction between literary debates and the pressure um, under apartheid in literary debates in the academy and outside the academy to write for a specific purpose and post apartheid where there is less, where, where people are completely unapologetic to yeah. make us do all sorts of things, to heal, to disagree about whether healing is even you know, part of what we should be doing, to do a whole range of things, include difficult things and, 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 and so on. And so I, I, yeah, I mean, I'm a bit taken aback by, by, that, by, the, by the accusation of utilitarianism by the, from this particular panel whose, work, whose words today and work across the board consistently has been opposed to any kind of utilitarian notion of any creative. Um, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think I just want to address quickly the issue of language and, and um, discomfort in, in this way. Uh, last year, I was commissioned by the Volksopera Hays in the Netherlands to write a play about um, Kratoa, a slave woman uh, who was taken into Van Riebeek's household as, as a young child in the 17th century. Um, I wrote the play in English, Afrikaans, Dutch, uh, the Dutch translation I was helped with, and Koi Koi Chovap. And the Dutch were terrified when, when they got the script and they said, this play is opening in Amsterdam and then it's going on a six weeks tour of the Netherlands. How are we going to do this? And it was very simple. We had a black backdrop and we projected white lettering. In Holland, we had the translations in Dutch and in South Africa when the play opened in Cape Town to a sold out season at Artscape, we had it in English. That was a matter of convenience. But the point that was made with the work is that we can write with modern technology in whatever language we choose, and we can reach people anywhere on the planet. So we shouldn't be restrained, because if I had been intimidated by the Dutch saying, we can't do this, this is going to be really impossible, I would have just kept to English and it would have been a very different kind of work. On the issue of, of discomfort and, and the kind of societies we're creating, and I, I like the, the fake, D uh, disagreement that they've created here between them. <laughs> um, it was it was very 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 nice for a very nice entertainment for the audience. Um, in in the writing of the play, uh, the the first time the, the the play is performed by by two characters, one playing Van Riebeek, which is a Dutch actor, and the other one playing Kratoa, the slave woman. Um, played by a Cape Town art uh, actress. And then we had two musicians on stage who also played some cameo roles, one Dutch musician and, and one Cape Town musician. And um, the first time the Dutch producers and, and performers saw the script was on day one of the Ursels in, in Cape Town before we opened in Holland. And there was just this silence at the end of the first reading. And I thought, oh, wow, I've written such an amazing play. They like deep in thought. They just hated it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And they, and they said to me that the Dutch audiences are not really going to cope with this. It's too disrupting. It's too hurtful. It's too traumatizing. It's too over the top. It's too everything. Anyway, we then went away and pretended to make some changes, but we didn't really. And, <laughs> and one of the scenes that they, that they um, found particularly uh, um, difficult to deal with, what, and which we use, it's a through line throughout the work, is about a um, woman in the in the 17th century burying a young child along with its mother. The, the baby was was a very young baby, and the mother died. And the community, and this is all in the archive in Van Riebeek's letters and journals, and the community buried this living baby together with the mother. And, and the way we use it in the play is, is, is very disturbing because what we're saying, and not very uh, directly, but in a very innovative, artistic way, is that the colonial disruption and the kind of society that pertained in a very short time after the arrival of the Dutch was such that people were doing such desperate things, that, that the, the kind of social conditions had become so terrible that people would rather bury a living baby than, than, than bring it up. So, so these are not issues that we're struggling with just in the 21st century. These are issues that, that have, have come with us for a very, very long time. And, and what is essential for writers is to recognize the roots of these issues. And then lastly, there was one night where um, the play was being performed at a, one of the many venues in, in, in the Netherlands. And at the end of the play, there's, we, almost always there was applause and a standing ovation just everywhere we went. But on this night, there was nothing. People just sat and looked at the, at the performers um, who were now standing in front of them and ready to take the bow, but you can't take a bow when there's no applause. <laughs> Absolutely nothing for two full minutes, and two minutes under these circumstances feels like an hour. And then, slowly, one by one, people started reacting, and the reason why they took so long is that they were deeply traumatized, so the Dutch were quite right in the beginning. <laughs> but but we went ahead with it anyway, and... and um, the, the the play has had such an impact that they are bringing um, the Dutch government is bringing it back for another season as part of their observation of 400 years of slavery. So if we stick to our guns and we stick to our story, there's no knowing what we can achieve. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Vollenhoven and uh, Professor Gola and Dr. Magona. Thank you for such a, a riveting uh, afternoon. Um, I hope that uh, you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you for being such an attentive audience. Uh, thank you to the University of Johannesburg and the Swedish Embassy for hosting this, this particularly important discussion. Please give yourselves a round of applause and thank you so much. <laughs>